Good evening, everybody, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Can everybody hear me? Yes, good. Um, great crowd, welcome. Uh, so that you know you're in the right place, this is the uh, first of three lectures, the ULAM lectures, put on by the Santa Fe Institute. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, have been to some of our public lectures. We usually put on one a month and uh, to try to uh, bring some of the uh, leading edge, latest kind of science that is going on to the uh, uh, public. And uh, once a year, we put on these ULAM lectures where we invite uh, one of our SFI community, the Santa Fe Institute community, to give a set of three lectures in a little more depth and explore a set of themes that uh, we think are compelling and of relevance uh, again, to the general public. And tonight's, I think, is a particularly relevant one. Uh, the, you saw the title before, A Cooperative Species, How We Got to Be Both Nasty and Nice by one of my favorite colleagues, Sam Bowles, whom I want to say a few words about. Um, I first want to remind you, those that are not so familiar, maybe, that uh, the, the whole raison d'etre of Santa Fe Institute is to bring together scholars from multiple disciplines and really forge serious transdisciplinary kinds of collaborative efforts addressing some of the big questions uh, both in terms of science and in terms of the uh, problems facing society. And again, I think uh, this set of lectures really fits that bill splendidly. Um, Sam, uh, I've known Sam uh, for the uh, years that I've been involved with the Santa Fe Institute. Uh, Sam came to the Santa Fe Institute uh, as a part of the faculty, uh, really probably in about 2000, and has been a resident faculty member uh, for those years, and we share him uh, with um, the University of Siena. Uh, Sam's work has covered an, a great breadth, and in the last years, he has become one of the leading researchers in this intriguing and extraordinarily important subject of the origins of altruism and its implications for, if you like, uh, the future of humanity and its relevance to some of the big problems. Um, <laughs> they, whoops, can everybody hear me? Is it okay? Um, this lecture, this set of lectures, and the work that Sam has been involved in covers everything from population genetics to archaeology, anthropology, economics, thrown in with a little bit of philosophy, dynamical systems, agent-based modeling, game theory, ethnography, even doing experiments on behavior, anthropological kinds of experiments, and those will be I'm sure exemplified as, uh, in, in the lectures. And Sam is uh, very much a quintessential SFI, SFIA, and in bringing many of these things together with an extraordinary group of collaborators. Uh, Sam's pedigree, so to speak, is also extremely interesting, and he's a, he's a remarkable man, I must say. He, uh, he got his degree, his undergraduate degree at Yale in 1960, uh, his PhD in economics from Harvard and uh, went on the faculty at Harvard, was on the faculty at Harvard for a number of years and has the marvelous distinction, I must say, which I hold tr tremendous respect for, of having been fired by Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> because, and this you really should clap for, Ed, because he refused to sign a loyalty oath. <laughs> so, um, he spent uh, the last part of his career before retiring from it at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, where he was a professor of economics, and that's when he took over uh, during that period, the latter part of that period, around the year 2000, the economics program at the Santa Fe Institute, which morphed into the behavioral sciences program 
which he now directs at the Institute. And this work is very much integral to uh, that whole program. Um, Sam, he, let me just tell you just a few odds and ends, a few anecdotes about Sam. Um, one is that uh, he went to school in India. He uh, went, and in fact, he went to a real Indian school. This, um, he and his sisters were the only non-Indians in that school. And the reason for this, incidentally, for those that are old enough to recognize it, was because his father was ambassador to India at the time. And uh, uh, his father was a major figure during the Kennedy era. Um, and I'm sure that had a big influence on the kinds of work that uh, Sam has done as an academic. Um, he also won awards um, on, uh, for uh, two concert tours in a choir, a male choir, uh, in the Soviet Union. He won awards for that, so he can maybe sing to us uh, <laughs> at some stage. He's a good baritone. Um, he's uh, taught in remote areas of Nigeria. He was an advisor, an economic advisor to Robert Kennedy during Robert Kennedy's abortive uh, um, candidacy for the presidency. He's been an advisor to Nelson Mandela post-apartheid uh, era. Um, and uh, he's just done some, what can I say, some marvelous things both in science and in terms of civic duty. Uh, I got to know Sam when I started to uh, get engaged with the Santa Fe Institute and uh, we um, shared an office. And uh, one of the things that uh, began to, and I used to go to the Santa Fe Institute from Los Alamos once a week, sometimes twice a week, and it, what was remarkable to me, it didn't matter what time I went to that office, Sam was always there. It didn't matter if I went up at 7.30 in the morning before going up to Los Alamos, Sam was there. And if I stayed to 6.30 or 7, Sam was still there. One of the things I can't stand about him is that he's a workaholic. <laughs> and uh, this really grated me, still does to some extent. And one, one Sunday, I was, um, uh, I was preparing to leave to give a lecture the next day on the East Coast, and I realized as in, early in the morning that I had forgotten some crucial part that I needed for the talk. And this was about 7.30, and I got in my car, and I remembered I'd left it on the desk at the Santa Fe Institute, and I drove up there, and on the way up, I thought, ah, the one compensation I have is that Sam, I will beat Sam to the office for once. And I drove into the parking lot of the Santa Fe Institute, no cars, nothing, absolutely dead. And I went into the building, and I went down to the office, and God damn it, there was <laughs> Sam. And to add insult to injury, Sam, of course, had biked up. And anyone that knows, I can barely walk up. And to add even more insult to injury, Sam is older than me, not by much. So the subject of tonight's talk is a really deep and fascinating one. And um, I wanted to, um, and I, I started thinking about it a little bit, and uh, thinking of um, how deep it is, despite the fact that he's going to talk a lot about, I think, uh, uh, evolutionary biology, and uh, how it can be that if you uh, have the naive view that uh, the fittest survive, survival of the fittest, how is it that some of, us, some of us turn out to be loving and altruistic and so on? It's a major question that worried Darwin. Um, and I decided I would turn to uh, some of the, uh, the deep thinkers and uh, some of the texts to see uh, who has thought about this and by those, I mean places like the Bible and Shakespeare and the Talmud and so on. And I'm not going to give you a whole bunch of quotes, but what I, what I thought I would do, given that I, we want to move on quickly, is that uh, the quotes I like best actually came, to my surprise in some way, from the Talmud. 
And um, we're all familiar with um, love thy neighbor as thyself, or some version of that. And uh, the version that I like that is Talmudic is uh, what is hateful for, to you, do not do to your fellow. That is the essence of the whole of law. The rest is commentary. And I think that's the loving side. And um, I think uh, another version of that is um, the famous one, which many of you are very familiar with, um, from Rabbi Hillel, apparently, who said, if I am not for myself, the dog-eat-dog -dog side, who will be for me? But if I am not for others, what am I? And if not now, when? And I think that somehow sums up the, the kind of dilemma that we all face on a daily basis and we face as a society and we face as a nation. So, with all that said, I want to turn you over to this remarkable man, uh, Sam Bowles, and who will expostulate on many of these themes. Before doing so, I have two other small things. One is to thank Penny Penland, who is sitting here in the audience, who is uh, supporting this lecture. She's been a marvelous contributor over the years to the Institute in supporting these lectures. And may I shamelessly ask anyone else in the audience that we're always open for further support of such lectures or anything else. And finally, I was asked to say that um, in the upcoming schedule, some of our lectures are not on the canonical Wednesday night. And you should, those that are attendees of the monthly lectures, uh, please make note of that, that you should look carefully that uh, some of them, one of them is on a Tuesday and one's a Thursday. So with that said, with that business taken care of, Sam, I very much look forward to your lectures. Great. Thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you for your interest in, uh, in my work and in these uh, questions that we'll be discussing. Thank you, Jeff, for your very generous uh, introduction. Uh, I love the people of Santa Fe. I don't know if there's any other city in the world in which you can get a vast number of people like this to come out to hear topics that are really hard, and I'm not going to lie to you. These are hard topics, and I'm not going to spare you some of the difficulty in trying to understand them. Uh, the, the topic is, why do vast numbers of humans cooperate with people they know only remotely, not even family members or kin, they do so sometimes under the incentives of economic gain. They sometimes do it under coercive circumstances. But there often is an element of goodwill, of generosity, of solidarity, which motivates them to, in this case, do a good job and work with the other fellow in this beautiful um, Diego Rivera um, fresco mural. Uh, but before we get going, how many people here who are eligible to vote are planned to vote in November? Okay, uh, okay, there's a few people who are probably not eligible, but uh, just, just uh, bear that in mind, just parenthesize that, uh, and um, that will become relevant uh, uh, later. Now, um, I want to talk about, that's David Hume, the Scottish economist and philosopher, better known as a philosopher, who proposed the following about designing our societies and organizing our lives. He said, political writers have established it as a maxim that in contriving any system of government, every man ought to be supposed to be a knave and to have no other end in all of his actions than his private interest. By this interest, we must govern him and by, and, and by means of it make him, notwithstanding his insatiable avarice and ambition, cooperate to the public good. Now, uh, this view of, was, of course, taken up in economics and became extraordinarily important primarily because of the work of the gentleman you're now looking at, Adam Smith. Adam Smith understood that it was possible to perform something akin to what a medieval alchemist would do, that is, to transform base human motives into valued social outcomes. And his idea about doing this, uh, developed in his famous book, The Wealth of Nations, is 
what he called the invisible hand, which would guide an economy of privately self-seeking members to a good end. It is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, and the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own interest. And this then became a foundation not only of economics, but of political philosophy and the work of people like Hobbes, Locke, and others, some preceding, um, uh, all of those preceding Adam Smith. Now, I call this the Constitution for Knaves Perspective. It now informs economic policy making around the world, the writing of constitutions, uh, other aspects of uh, um, designing societies like criminal deterrence, uh, educational policies, management strategies, and so on. It has become an incredibly powerful idea. Uh, biologists have taken it up as well uh, with a slightly different perspective. Uh, They've embraced the idea of self-interest as a disciplining metaphor for how biological evolution might take place. Uh, here's Richard Dawkins. Like successful Chicago gangsters, our genes have survived, in some cases for millions of years, in a highly competitive world. This entitles us to expect certain qualities in our genes. A predominant quality to be expected in a successful gene is ruthless selfishness. This gene selfishness will usually uh, give rise to selfishness of individual behavior. Now, um, if genes are selfish, how are the seemingly generous, moral, and civic-minded things that we see around us all the time to be explained? Do some of you recognize that little guy in the top corner? Do you remember him? He was about this tall, and he was walking with Yao at the opening of the, uh, of the Olympics. He was the guy who, during the earthquake, he was a hall monitor. And having pulled two of his friends out of the rubble, he ran back into the collapsing building. And somebody asked him, uh, his name is Lin Hao, somebody asked him, why did you do that? He's 10 years old. And he said, because I'm a hall monitor. That's what we're supposed to do. Um, now, the other picture, of course, you recognize uh, the uh, courageous and one has to say altruistic firemen of the uh, people uh, of the city of New York. Now, usually the way this dilemma, which is we appear to see selfish activities, but we know the genes should not be, uh, uh, so sorry, we appear we see altruistic activities, but genes must be selfish. There is a way of reconciling this, famously put forth by the American ed editor and journalist. Conscience is the inner voice that warns us that somebody may be looking or in slightly more academic form by the, by the uh, uh, distinguished biologist Richard Alexander, ethics, morality, human conduct, and the moral psyche are to be understood only if societies are seen as collections of individuals seeking their own self-interest. Now, uh, I love this picture uh, of Lin Hao because he seems to be looking at this quote and saying, <laughs> uh, well, I wonder if that's why I went in that building. And that fireman, who may well be no longer with us, uh, probably was not thinking that his picture was being taken at the moment that he entered that building. And so we have a train wreck between this idea that we do apparently generous things because of self-interest and our everyday observation of what it looks to us like that people are doing things because they have moral commitments or they have some desire to do the right thing. Uh, you recognize this picture also. This was a very moving picture to me because I've uh, worked in South Africa uh, with the South African trade union movement before apartheid, actually starting in 1961, uh, and I had the privilege of then advising first the trade unions and then uh, President Mandela. These are the people lined up to vote in the first democratic election in South Africa. It's a wonderful image. Uh, you can imagine how long they waited. Uh, uh, like the people in this hall, uh, there are not apparently very many knaves amongst them because voting takes some time. In this case, a few hours probably, standing in the sun. Apparently it was quite hot that day. Uh, with obviously statistically no chance whatsoever of affecting the outcome. So the very fact that people will stand in line and vote is kind of puzzling. Of course, um, Hume didn't think about this because the number of people allowed to vote in England in the 1740s was sufficiently small so that maybe voting did count there. Um, now, 
this paradigm, somebody may be looking, constitution for knaves, is mistaken. Uh, we're all knaves, sometimes, we're like other animals, but humans succeeded as a species because sometimes some of us are not. And I mean that quite literally, and I'll come to that, back to that in the, fifth, in, the, in the third lecture. I think we succeeded, spread around the world, peopled the world, all parts of it, because of the very characteristics which we're here discussing, that is that we are not acting only because somebody might be looking, we're acting for other reasons. Now, the evidence for this, uh, uh, and how we came to be this uniquely cooperative species, and why this matters for the future, is what I'll try to address uh, tonight, tomorrow night, and Thursday. What I'll do today is uh, a little bit of deck clearing. Uh, I want to show uh, that many important forms of cooperation, and the ones which distinguish us from other animals, could not be the result of self-interest with a long time horizon, or any other self-interest-based model. Uh, those models do not explain why we act the way we do in the cooperative situations, some of which I've just indicated, and I'm about ready to tell you more about which types of behavior I'm talking about. But having done this, the self-interest models don't work. That's the bad news. The good news is that there's extensive evidence from my experiments, but really from hundreds of others, uh, that we have uh, uh, predispositions uh, to behave generously and to behave fairly uh, towards people way beyond our immediate family. And we're also happy uh, to engage in costly activities to punish those who violate social norms. Uh, itself, of course, an altruistic act to uphold social order and social decency. Um, that thing over there, you'll recognize. Some computer programs, that comes up if you use a bad word in one of your emails. I, I, used to, I had to d disable that one. Uh, but um, this thing over here means that the thing it's indicating is um, a hot topic. Uh, and uh, I, I was also going to have a hammer. And I was going to put a hammer up there because I wanted to indicate the stuff that I thought was nailed down. Because a lot of the stuff is controversial. And I'm giving you, of course, a rather uh, brief run through of this. Uh, but I think um, if it doesn't have, um, uh, if it's not a hot topic, it's because I think it's nailed down. Uh, there are a lot of people who would disagree about this. This is pretty uncontroversial, uh, but not well known. Now, before we start, we have to do, you know, like in the, the word, right? Um, we have to do some stuff about words. When I use the word cooperation, I mean participating uh, with others, sorry, with others in a common project that yields mutual benefits, although not necessarily benefits to the actor net of the costs that he or she's undertaken. Altruism is defined conventionally as behaviors benefiting others at a cost to oneself, and what that means is that one would have higher fitness or wealth or some other value to end if one abandoned the behavior. Now, now we come to the Mother Teresa problem. Uh, People get confused about this because Mother Teresa helps the poor, helped the poor in Calcutta. Um, and she really got a kick out of it. She loved doing it. Uh, and therefore, are we to say that Mother Teresa was selfish? Uh, no, I think not. Mother Teresa obviously was helping others at a cost to herself. She could have been doing something else. Now, the problem here is we need a few extra words because altruism is a description of a behavior and its consequences for others and oneself. People are motivated by their desires, by their needs, by what economists call their preferences or tastes or habits uh, or moral uh, commitments. So I want to introduce a couple of additional words. Uh, the word preferences just means the way you evaluate an outcome that might result from your actions. It's a pro and con statement about whether you like something or not, would like it to come about. The word self-regarding preferences means those preferences that consider only the things, the outcomes that are going to happen to me. Uh, that's my stand-in for the word selfish. I use self-regarding because I want to define it exactly. It's acting, taking account of only the action, what the action is going to cause me. And then, of course, we have other regarding preferences. Those include uh, taking account of how your action is going to affect somebody else. Um, and 
these other regarding preferences here, of course, they may motivate um, altruistic behavior. So we're distinguishing be between a behavior here and the reasons for the behavior, that is the motives, the psychological proximate motives that may account for them. Now, what we have to understand is we observe that people are acting like this a lot of the time. I'll show you why I think we observe that. And therefore, we have to ask why these kinds of preferences, desires, needs, and so on, could have beco become common among us. Now, I want to start with saying a bit more about why humans are really such unique animals. We do this kind of thing. Uh, we do, um, I'll just give you a list, the list could go on. Um, we engage with large numbers of non-kin. That's the crucial thing. That really distinguishes us from a lot of other animals, including social insects. We engage in joint production, like a barn raising. Uh, uh, we engage in warfare. Uh, we do co-insurance, that is, we share food on a broad scale, whether we're hunter-gatherers in the southern Africa or whether we're modern uh, uh, citizens of a welfare state. Um, we sustain social norms. We're willing actually to risk be getting beaten up sometimes to go to tell somebody, hey, that's no way to treat somebody else. Uh, uh, and we do that in other ways which are costly to ourselves. We obey laws when we could get away with it, get away with uh, transgressing them at some gain to ourselves. We share information. Uh, we co-parent. By co-parenting, I don't mean just uh, in the family, but we uh, people take care of other people's kids very extensively, either informally or through modern uh, provision of those services. And, of course, we vote. Uh, now, obviously, I could go on, but notice these all have the character of these, this, these behaviors extend often to very large numbers of non-kin. Now, my first task is to show you that the models that seek to explain uh, human cooperation as if it was based solely on, on self-interest, those models fail. Uh, a very powerful and persuasive and correct model called kin altruism uh, says that we will help relatives, uh, uh, close uh, genetic relatives, uh, because they are likely, with high probability, to bear our genes, and a gene which predisposes us to do that could spread. That's absolutely correct, but of course, that cannot explain why we cooperate so extensively with people to whom we are substantially unrelated. And that happens in experiments and in the real world. Now, just a little footnote, uh, this uh, actually, kin altruism, maybe surprisingly, it doesn't even explain what goes on within families very well. Uh, uh, I'd be happy to talk about the, the details about that. I've published, actually, uh, some on that topic. But just think about bequests. Think about wills. Wills are typically go to your spouse, to whom you're not related. Uh, now, that's a puzzle. I mean, you can think of some reasons why that might be, but you have to work pretty hard to reconcile a simple kin altruism argument. Uh, what the thing I studied in South Africa was when migrants who are working in the mines, send money home to their families. They send vast amounts of money home, by the way. Uh, uh, can you predict where they're going to send it by how closely related they are genetically to the members of the household to which they're sending it? And the answer is, yeah, you get a pretty good prediction, except for the fact that the fact that the spouse is in the household is far too important for any possible explanation based on the kin altruism model. Uh, so, there's obviously a lot more going on, even within families, than the kin altruism model. Reciprocal altruism seems to be a much more robust model because it doesn't require that the interactions be among close family members. This is based on repeated interactions. And the basic idea is basically, uh, I scratch your back, you scratch mine. This works because the person who helps today expects to be helped tomorrow, and lacking this, the helper defects and that punishes the defector, and that enforces the kind of cooperation. Um, now, in, um, the, the, what's, the, the reason why these papers, uh, particularly this one here, was thought to be so, well, both of them were very important, is because it showed that reciprocal altruism, which I'll use RA, it supports cooperation among egotists. That's the title that uh, Axelrod used. Uh, in, in ensuring, um, uh, in if you have a, an enduring relationship which is dyadic, that is two-person, it really works strongly to support cooperation in those situations, no matter how selfish the individuals are. However, 
uh, reciprocal altruism fails when groups are large, and by large I mean three or four, uh, not to mention ten, uh, or when information is private, known to some but not to others, or noisy, sometimes erroneous, or when interactions are not long-lasting. Now, um, I want to explain why this is true. Th this is an important point, because what happens in the classroom is somebody takes a two-person model based on this, like, for example, Axelrod and Hamilton, and they show that it'll work with two people. And then they say, well, we can extend this to ten people. Uh, that's false. Uh, it can't be extended even to four people. Uh, it's very difficult. It breaks down, and I'll show you why. Uh, this is um, the game which is usually used. This is the prisoner's dilemma game, and um, it's the opposite of the invisible hand. I call it the invisible foot uh, for the reasons which you'll see. There are two players, and they choose an action simultaneously. Uh, cooperating costs the actor C, and it gives B to the other player. Uh, the payoffs, whether they're in money or fitness or subjective well-being, are shown here, and we have the payoffs here for the row player, so that if the individual cooperates and the other guy cooperates, they get B minus C, because you paid C, but you got B from the other guy. If you both defect, you get zero. If you defect on the guy, you pay nothing, but you get B from him. So I think you understand how that works. Uh, there are gains to cooperation, that is, B minus C is a positive number, and that's better than defecting. Uh, but there are even greater gains to defecting on your partner who's a cooperator. Now, the reason why this game, The Prisoner's Dilemma, became one of the really dominant metaphors in the behavioral sciences in the past uh, half century, challenging the invisible hand as a catchy term, is because though there is this benefit from cooperating, the individually maximizing strategy is to defect. So defect maximizes payoffs whatever the other person is going to do. So it doesn't depend on your belief about what they do. You can see that right away, that B is better than B minus C, and zero is better than minus C. So whatever the other guy does, you better defect. It's called, in game theory, the dominant strategy. Now, how do we escape this by repeating the game? Well, it's a very clever argument, uh, and it's if the interaction is ongoing, then what's called a tit-for-tat strategy, which I say just TFT, is possible. You can first cooperate, and then do whatever your partner did the previous period. Uh, if the interaction is repeated with some probability delta, it will last, in expectations, one over one minus delta periods. That, so it, suppose the, uh, suppose the, the, uh, the probability of continuing delta um, is, uh, is 0.9, well, then that interaction on the average will last for 10 periods. Um, so a tit-for-tat player, if he's, if he's facing another tit-for-tat player, he's going to get this B minus C for 1 over uh, 1 minus delta rounds, 10 in my example. If he defected, he would get B, but that would be it. He'd get it for one round and zero thereafter as long as the game went on. Uh, so. Uh, and this is, the, this is the news, if delta is large enough, actually if delta is greater than C minus B, then uh, both mutual defect, that will always be in equilibrium, but tit for tat will be in equilibrium too, so they could end up both doing this thing here. Um, and um, now the reason why that's true, remember this, is that the tit for tat player playing with another tit for tat guy cannot benefit by defecting because he's then going to get just B one time, as opposed to getting B minus C for uh, the whole duration of the game. So this explains why cooperation could occur. It's one of two possible equilibria. It might happen. Uh, but of course, notice it's not altruistic, because the person who's a tit-for-tatter playing against another tit-for-tatter is doing the thing which maximizes his well-being, or his, in this case, his fitness or payoffs. He's not sacrificing anything. Now, that's why it works. And that's why it was a really exciting idea, beginning with Trivers and then developed by Hamilton Axelrod. Uh, but it fails in groups. This is less widely known. Um, so in the standard two-person game, notice the following. If my partner defects, then I know this. I know he's defected with certainty, because my payoffs are low. And then, if I defect on him, I, with certainty, punish him. Change the story a little bit. Make the group a neighborhood, a work group, uh, some kind of uh, organization, uh, n greater than 2, 
It's called an end-person prisoner's dilemma game, sometimes called a public goods game. In this case, the mechanism breaks down. Here's why. First thing is, I may not know who defected. Remember, if it's just two people, I know for sure the other guy defected. But that's not really the most serious problem. Uh, suppose I notice that somebody defected, and I defect in order to punish him. I've also then punished all of my other comrades who were cooperating. So the only way in this game you can punish the guy who defected is by essentially just withdrawing entirely and punishing a large number of other people who were adhering to the norm. But it gets worse. Unless they know why I defected, then they'll punish me because they see me defecting. So this happens often in large groups. Either I don't know who defected, or I do know who defected, but other people don't know that I'm defecting because they defected. And as a result, cooperation quickly unravels. Now, uh, I think you can see the problem. In the two-person two case, my withdrawal of cooperation is a targeted punishment, and here it's not. And as groups get large, you're likely to have a lot of noise in the information. Let me show you some simulations that I did with uh, Herbert Gintis, my uh, co-author. Um, the, um, what we have here, th these, are th these skyscrapers, the height of the skyscraper is the amount of cooperation that you're getting. This is the size of the group, ranging, th these are the dyadic interactions, and here we have size 14. And here's the error rate. That's the probability that a person who intended to cooperate either didn't cooperate or was perceived at, ha at having failed to cooperate. Um, and this just gives you a measure of the unraveling process when the, uh, the B is 2, the benefit is 2, and the cost is 1. And you can see that even for groups of 4, if the error rate is 6%, you don't get any cooperation. And for groups of sub substantial size, you get a lot of cooperation with zero errors, but even the smallest amount of, mis uh, mis of uh, uh, either mistakes or mistaken perceptions um, will cause the thing to unravel. But notice, the dyad, of course, works. It's supposed to work, and it does work. Uh, here we have a situation where the benefit-cost ratio B over C is 4. You can see cooperation does a little better. But here, Gindis and I were cheating, because we assumed that any time anybody defected, that was common knowledge. So there wasn't this problem of people getting punished because they punished somebody else, when the, when, uh, and they were thought to be an original defector as opposed to a guy standing up for the norm. Look what happens if we have information that's private. So here we have information in which uh, the information that I have may not be shared with other people. And here you have, uh, basically, there's no cooperation at all. I mean, uh, even a size of group four doesn't work. Uh, and here, with the, high, with the higher benefit-cost ratio, if you get to groups of six, or actually four, uh, plausible error rates are actually just kill it. Now, you think, well, how do I know what a plausible error rate is? Okay, think about the last time you worked in a co-op or in a political organization or a church, and there was some joint obligation that was supposed to be done. And pretty soon there was some gossip about whether so-and-so had done what they were supposed to do. It's really hard to tell, because you don't know, well, maybe they really were sick, et cetera. So uh, the idea that you make only 6 you know, 6% errors, uh, errors 6% of the time, is I think that's a pretty low error rate. Uh, particularly if we're talking I either about today, in groups of five or ten, or the past. Now, there are a lot of other self-interest models. Uh, it's r a real growth industry, particularly among economists and some biologists. Um, there's um, there's uh, something called indirect reci reciprocity. There's what's called an economics of folk theorem. I know it sounds enticing, but uh, trust me, you'll be happy that if I don't explain it. Um, <laughs> the, um, the only interesting part is why it's called the folk theorem. Um, no, it's a very interesting theorem, but it's, very, it's actually a very hard theorem to, to, uh, to prove. Um, now, these fail for similar reasons. That is, noisy information and private information when you have large groups. There is, there is a contender, and that's called signaling. Suppose I'm, uh, suppose I'm a hunter, and I hunt successfully, and I bring back meat and give it away. I've just advertised the fact that I'm a good hunter. Now, suppose that advertisement is a signal of some other quality, uh, which is not uh, observable, but correlated with that. So somebody says, oh, Sam's a good hunter. Well, he might be a, a nice guy to have kids with, or he might be a bad guy to get into a fight with, or he might be a good coalition partner. 
So the basic idea is you can engage in socially pro-social activities as a signal of some trait that makes you a desirable mate or coalition partner. There are examples of this. Generosity, defense of the community, hunting and distributing prey. I think those models actually explain a lot about what's going on. But notice, these are examples of signaling, and so are these. Very nice signals of your ability to make money, conspicuous consumption. Or if you want to show how rich you are, why don't you just go on drinking binges? Uh, that'll show that you have the capacity to pay for a lot. How about beating up your neighbor? That's just as good as beating up the guys in the next valley. It demonstrates your prowess. Uh, or how about getting a lot of academic credentials? That's also another form of uh, signaling. Uh, now, uh, I think the signaling models work. I've actually published stuff uh, about signaling models. I don't think they're a failure, but they're incomplete because they don't explain uh, why cooperation should be the result. As I say, as Thorsten Veblen said, conspicuous consumption does just as well as defending your community. Um, now, so to sum up this uh, segment, the somebody may be looking paradigm uh, as an explanation of human cooperation. As I say, kin altruism is a very good explanation of some aspects of cooperation within the family. Reciprocal altruism works well in dyads or small groups when information is public and error-free and the interaction long-lived, but it breaks down under uh, other conditions, noisy, private information, large groups. Um, now, uh, so the, um, the, the part of the explanation may not be that somebody may be looking. Uh, part of the explanation about why people cooperate uh, is that people actually love to cooperate. Uh, they get gratification from it, or they feel ethically that they ought to do it. Uh, so I want to explore what we know about individuals being self-interested all the time. Now, it took at least two decades, actually beginning in 1982, of very clever experiments, I didn't design any of these, uh, to discover just how bad a predictor of behavior self-interest was. Now, this is interesting because um, among economists and biologists, the assumption of self-interest is really very deeply rooted. Uh, it's a very useful tool. It, it performs an, an important disciplining uh, uh, function for theory, and it's been extremely difficult to dislodge that uh, in, um, in, in economics and in biology. Uh, what happened was a whole bunch of experiments, interestingly, a lot of them done by economists, uh, uh, really sort of um, blew the lid off the self-interest assumptions. But I want to say, why experiments? Because probably, um, if you were a student in a university now, uh, you probably would have been invited to do behavioral experiments, and you would have made a little money doing that. But um, when I was in college, we didn't even know about it. Now, it's commonplace that everybody, uh, that not everybody is self-regarding. So, um, but we need to know more than that. I mean, sometimes when I'm, when I'm presenting my experimental results to, say, sociologists or anthropologists, or for that matter, businessmen, they say, tell me something I didn't know. I never thought that everybody was selfish. Uh, but I insist that these experiments are extraordinarily valuable because they tell you quantitatively how many, what types of non-selfish activity do they engage in? How do incentives matter? If we vary the incentives, what do we get? If we vary the framing of the experiment, the kind of labeling of it, what do we get? We can do these things, um, uh, wh and which we can't really do with self-reports. Uh, I won't go into the details, but we know now that self-reports about do you trust people, uh, those are pr just about worthless. I mean, uh, just about zero correlation with whether people will loan their bicycle or loan their CDs or what they do in an experiment having to do with trust. So experiments allow us to manipulate um, uh, some of the things that may affect behavior while controlling for other confounds. And they also allow us to observe real decisions made with you almost always anonymously, not entirely, almost always anonymously, and sometimes with, with always with real money on the table and sometimes with big money on the table. So people are really making decisions about something which grasps their attention. They're not going to be making it up. Um, now, there's one, a single experiment as I say, um, really changed how social scientists think about the behavioral foundations of economics and sociology and other fields, and that's called the ultimatum game. Uh, I have to explain it to you. There are two subjects. It's played anonymously. It's non-repeated. It's a so-called one-shot game. 
Uh, the first player, called the proposer, is allocated a, a sum of money. It's called the pie or the pot or some other culinary thing like that. And um, is instructed to offer a portion of the amount that he's been given to the other who's called the responder. The responder knows how much the proposer got, and so he's going to see how much the guy's going to give to him. Uh, then the responder can either accept or reject the offer. Uh, now, the payoffs are as follows. If the responder accepts, then she receives the amount of the offer, uh, and the, the proposer receives what, uh, what he kept behind, didn't offer. On the other hand, if the responder rejects, both the responder and the proposer get nothing. And that's the end of the game. That's all there is. Okay? Now, everybody, you're all game theorists now. Okay? And I know th that's okay because you don't really know what it means. But uh, y you're all game theorists and you're all economists. Oh, uh, just think about it. Uh, how would a game theorist who is an economist predict that this game would be played? We have a term in economics, it's an ancient one, homo economicus or economic man. How would economic man play this game? So think about it. What a game theorist will tell you is, well, the first thing you have to do is you have to do a fancy thing called backward induction. So the proposer puts himself in the shoes of the responder and says, what will she do? Well, uh, economic man, if she's economic man, or economic lady, uh, she's going to take any positive offer because a penny's better than zero. Um, well, then I, I'm going to offer her a penny, and she'll accept it. And so that's the, what's called in game theory the equilibrium of that game. It, on the assumption that the proposer is selfish, and the proposer knows that the other person is also selfish. Well, I wouldn't be telling you all this if that's the way it worked out when this game was first played in Germany in 1982. Uh, the um, Worldwide, in over 100 studies, mostly with students, the modal offer is 50%. That is, the proposer offers half. The mean offer is about 42, and interestingly, uh, offers less than 20% are rejected even when the stakes are very large. And by very large, I mean a month's salary, or, you know, uh, actually three times that in uh, one of the experiments in Indonesia. Uh, so people will say no. They'll turn away large sums. Now, my interpretation of this, there are others, but I think this is, this is one of the things I would have put the hammer next to. I think the most obvious and parsimonious interpretation is people are willing to pay big money to penalize people who treat them badly. Uh, it's common throughout the world. Uh, we've not found a culture in which it doesn't happen. Uh, and uh, it seems to be fairly universal. Now, I was very suspicious of the fact that in, in so many different societies, in Beijing and Ljubljana and Tel Aviv and Pittsburgh, the uh, student subjects were doing the same thing. They were turning down these offers, and they were offering about a half, and so on. So with a team of 12 anthropologists and five economists, we implemented uh, this game, the ultimatum game, in 15 small-scale societies. I'll show you where they were in just a minute. But in none of them did the experimental subjects uh, conform to the self-interest axiom. Uh, some of them gave too much. The responders would give, you know, easily they'd give 50, but sometimes they gave 70, in some cases they gave all. Uh, and uh, the... Uh, and as with students in Pittsburgh, Tel Aviv, Beijing, and so on, uh, they, they would reject low offers. Um, one or the other or both. This is a paper which is in Behavior and Brain Science uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and that's, that's what we thought we were going to find when we went around. You know, we were looking for these guys like in this Degas painting of um, La Bourse. Uh, probably we shouldn't have expected to find him where we were looking, though. Uh, here's a group of herders in Kenya. We did experiments with them. Uh, these are lowland uh, South Americans. These are um, from uh, 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 New Guinea. Uh, and these, if you set aside Zurich, Kansas City, and what do we have, Detroit over there in Michigan, uh, I, um, th those are not the... We did do experiments there, but we were pre-testing the experiments in the field. That's all these ones here. Now, I'll only mention a couple of them because uh, uh, the, the point is repeated over and over again. Uh, among the Ache in Paraguay, uh, uh, we did the experiment in which uh, a very large number of people offered half or almost uh, halves, and as you can see, a lot of people offered more. 
Uh, a few offered less, uh, but these, all of these, the, the, there was a very strong tendency for equal division, as indeed there is equal division in other food, uh, uh, food items like uh, honey or meat uh, or other uh, uh, nutrition which is acquired in large packages. And I'm happy to say that one of the greatest experts on Aceh society is here in the audience tonight. Hilly Kaplan is here. Uh, and I, I won't call upon him to comment on, the, uh, on these experiments, but he's a professor at UNM and he's also a professor uh, at the Santa Fe Institute. When we move on to Africa, Tanzania, the Hadza, um, we had a rather different picture. The offers were pretty low. I mean, notice that's a mean offer. That's not Pittsburgh or Beijing or Tel Aviv or, uh, uh, or Zurich. Uh, but here we have some really striking behavior. The offers were low, but the rejections were extraordinarily frequent. Uh, people rejected these offers, and this is, you know, this is a lot of money. Still, 20% uh, of the prize was a lot. So people were turning those things down. Uh, and uh, uh, this, uh, one imagines that this is also mimicking the behavior of the Hadza, who are famous for being involved in contestation over gifts and transfers. I actually spent some time with the Hadza uh, and um, I know a little bit about how they organize their society. They're quite different from the Aceh, uh, but they do end up sharing a lot, but it's usually through some kind of um, contestation. Uh, so they were pushing the envelope, and a lot of times they were losing their bet by offering too low and getting turned down. Now, um, I want to turn to some recent experiments uh, with uh, student subjects. Uh, and say what I, why I think they're important. These are with Swiss students. This is a fantastic experiment done by uh, one of the guys who I think is one of the leading figures in this experimental behavioral economics and behavioral social science, Ernst Fair, and his colleague uh, Simon Gechter. Uh, Fair was also, oh, sorry, I spelled his name wrong there, F-E-H-R. Fair was also on the external faculty of the Santa Fe Institute. Um, this is a public goods game. Let me explain it to you. The idea is this. Um, uh, you have a, a group of people, and you can put something in to contribute. Uh, and uh, anything, zero, so you're given 10, 10 units. You can give zero up to 10. Uh, the amount is pooled, and then the experimenter doubles the amount that's been contributed and distributes it back to everybody equally. Okay, that is a prisoner's dilemma with more than two people, because the best thing for you is to contribute nothing, and everybody else should contribute a lot. But whatever they do, you're better off if you contribute nothing. So again, the dominant strategy is zero contribution. Now, they tried an interesting wrinkle here. They said, well, suppose, uh, well, look, here's what happened. They could have contributed 20. That was the total they could contribute. This is the first period of the game. It goes up to 10 periods. This is the average contribution. They started out contributing a little more than six. That's interesting. They were, w why didn't they contribute zero? But they, as time went on, they came to contribute almost zero. Uh, now, there are a lot of speculations about that, what that might be, but it's a kind of unraveling. They were trying, and then they noticed some other people weren't contributing, and the only thing they could do was withdraw their own contribution. And so down it goes. That's the unraveling process I talked about. Then here, they said, OK, we're going to change the rules a little bit. These are all done on computer screens, by the way. Uh, and so at the end of each round, it said, here, here are the people in your group, of course, by letter, not by name. Uh, a contributed this much, B contributed that much, and then it, uh, a, a sign on the screen says, uh, um, would you like to pay to reduce the payoffs of any member of your group? We don't use the word punishment, but there's basically, you're going to put some money down to zap one of, the, one of your fellow group members. Uh, and that's what happens in these dark dots here. Uh, two things you could notice. First, they started out a little higher, and then they went up. And by the way, if you let them go further, they would keep on going up. Uh, now, there's a puzzle here. Some of you probably already figured it out. Notice, is the um, self-interest predicts zero contributions, but it also, self-interest predicts no punishment. Why? Because punishment is a public good. Punishment is doing something that's costly to benefit the group. So there's no difference between the contribution, paying something to help the group, and punishing somebody at a cost, which will help the group. Uh, the interesting thing is that when you allow them, when you give them no punishment, it unravels. When you allow them to punish, the thing takes off. Uh, so this is punishment by peers. Uh, 
Keep this in mind because I'm going to come back to why this is important and why it's important for us having a great future or even a sustainable future uh, in the third lecture. The fact that peer punishment works uh, is an essential part of this. But notice what we've learned here is that under the right circumstances, you can get altruistic activity going on a, on a big scale, even in large groups. Now, is it altruistic? Yes, of course it's altruistic. It, the punishment is altruistic. Uh, now, by the way, in a lot of these, in, including in this one, the punishment's altruistic because you know that. You're paying money and you don't have to, uh, and it helps the others. Is the contribution altruistic? Think a little bit. Well, if you contribute, you avoid punishment. So you have to actually do the math and figure out, were the punishments large enough so that the best response in terms of maximizing your payoffs was to contribute more? The answer was no. So that's an interesting puzzle. Getting punished incentivized people to contribute more, but it wasn't because they made more money. It's probably because they felt ashamed. And I, I want to come back to that too. I want to get back to the psychology of why it is that these kind of um, multilateral cooperation setups really work. Now I want to summarize a few of the other experimental results. Um, we know that people respond to symbolic punishment. There's an experiment done by one of our colleagues in the 15 uh, uh, small-scale societies projects um, in southern Africa. And she did a public goods game just like Fair and Gector did. But she had a nice wrinkle, uh, which is uh, after everybody had um, contributed, then her assistant went around um, uh, and would stand in front of the chair of the woman who was sitting there and uh, say, um, Mrs. Nsugunu gave uh, two shillings out of a total of 20 that she could have given. Does anybody have anything they'd like to say about that? <laughs> and then, you know, the uproar, stingy lady, no, one, no wonder no one ever comes to your house, you don't get any food. Um, and uh, it went all the way around, and then occasionally somebody would say, uh, uh, Mr. Ngoma gave uh, uh, 20. And then people would say, silly man, wasting money. Don't you care about your family? Uh, and, uh, but the interesting thing about this was, notice there's no monetary effect of this, but it had a huge impact, uh, a very large impact. So notice, people are responding to something about the community even when there's no money uh, cost to it. Here's a, third, uh, here's a second result that I think is really inspiring. People punish people who not only hurt them, but peop people who hurt peop other people. Uh, in fact, punishment of people who have harmed a third party is almost as strong as punishment of people who hurt yourself. Uh, the, um, uh, there, for example, uh, there's what we call third party punishment experiments. So A, give some money to B. C is just an onlooker. But after C has observed what I did, then we ask C, C, would you like to re reduce your payoffs some to reduce the payoffs of Mr. A? Um, and um, the, uh, so, and that, that's a very strong result, because notice what that says. It's not that I'm angry at the guy who hurt me. Of course I am. Uh, and maybe anger is also associated with my punishing him even if he hurt somebody else. But we're getting pretty close to something that sounds like ethical reasoning because it's, it's, uh, it's anonymous. It doesn't matter whether it happened to me or somebody else, it's wrong anyway. So the people who are doing that are probably, ha the, the, the thing that's motivating them is something which would motivate them also to uphold social norms. They don't do it equally. Ethnic and group boundaries matter. The same game, the third party punishment game, was uh, done by Fair and a couple of colleagues in Papua New Guinea. Uh, with the two tribes, were, as you know, in Papua New Guinea there's a lot of hostility among tribes, but these tribes were not hostile, they were just different. Um, and um, the, the, on, the bystander, onlooker, whatever it's called, Mr. C punished A more if B, the one who got unfairly treated, uh, was of the same tribe as C, uh, and if A was not. So in other words, ethnic boundaries really matter in the behavior. Uh, the, um, uh, and also here, uh, one, one of my students from South Africa uh, found that white students in South Africa expected less reciprocation from black students, and therefore were less generous to them in what's called a trust game. Uh, so uh, the ethnic identity, race, uh, and religion in other cases uh, does make a difference. It, by the way, it doesn't always make a difference, and there's some extremely instructive cases, which I'll talk about tomorrow, in which it doesn't appear, because we'd really like to know the conditions under which that's not there. We'd like to study those, try to replicate them. 
um, cultures differ tremendously. Uh, the, um, the, the first wave of experiments said it doesn't matter whether you're in Beijing or Pittsburgh. The, the, the next wave of the experiments, the one in which I was involved, said it matters greatly if you're uh, uh, among the Ache or the Lamalera or somebody else. Uh, you can range from giving half or giving more than half to giving a quarter. You can range from very few rejections to massive rejections. Um, uh, what we found out, for example, it was the Lamalera who hunt whales, uh, and they're very good at sharing, obviously, because they catch these big things only rarely, and they have to learn how to share. They were very good at sharing in these, uh, in these games. Uh, they gave fairly, uh, and they, they gave either 50% or greater. They gave on the average 58%, that is so. On the average, they were actually giving away more than half. Um, the um, institutions matter. Uh, here's an example. If you call the prisoner's dilemma game the Wall Street game, everybody defects. If you call it the community game, they cooperate. Uh, <laughs> oh, I shouldn't have said that tonight. <laughs> you know, it's actually, it's, it's kind of rough giving this talk tonight because the Republicans are now saying that Wall Street is greedy. And uh, if the Republicans are calling them greedy, how can I possibly stand here before you and say that human beings are actually generous? Um, but um, in any case, I think the labeling of the game has a big part in saying, okay, you're in a situation, competition or something, in which it's okay to defect or you're not. Um, this is another one um, that, I, that I, th I find this rather chilling, actually. If the proposer was selected by scoring high on a trivia test, so then, you know, the people come in, they take this, the, really, it's really a trivia test, and they say, okay, you guys did really well, you get to be the proposers. Now notice, the proposers are the advantaged ones. They're going to get at least half in America. Uh, and so you guys get to be the proposers. Sorry, it was a hard test. You guys are the uh, respondents over here. The proposers uh, offer much less if they were allocated not randomly, but by a trivia test. And guess what? The respondents accept these low offers. Okay, I wish I could go down this road. It's something which disturbs me hugely because what it means is that a, a little trivia test gives these people a sense of being deserving or undeserving and that means they'll accept less or more. If one trivia test does this, how do you think going to school in America works? Think of the impact of being in the slow track or being told that you basically couldn't do it. Uh, and that's not just one trivia test, that's 12 years. But as I say, if I went down that, it would be a different talk. Um, in economics, economics did not welcome these results. Uh, I think we could say that. Uh, uh, in fact, I think you would have gotten instant tenure if you'd found out something that was wrong with him. So, if, I mean, we, re we really can put a hammer next to this one because everybody tried to show that this was wrong. Now, there's still some confusion because Economists love to talk about rational action. It's a very valuable paradigm. I use it myself. Uh, but rationality just means that you do things purposefully and you do them consistently. But economists use the word rational to mean selfish. So it's important to see, are people who are altruistic actually being irrational? Well, what would be, how would we test that? Well, one of our faculty members at the Institute, John Miller, along with Andriani, published a paper in uh, the top journal in economics, Econometrica, uh, which he showed that if you vary the price of altruism, so I can give you a dollar by paying a dollar, or I can give you three dollars by paying a dollar, or I can give you 50 cents by paying a dollar, that's what they did. People responded to that just the way they would to the price of ice cream. In other words, people's altruism came at a price. They're willing to do it, but they weren't willing to do it if it cost them a huge sum. Now, why is that important? Well, first, I think that's obvious. It doesn't mean that altruism doesn't exist. It means it's like other things. It's like other things that we like to do or feel committed to do, but we're not going to do them irrespective of their costs. Uh, there's other evidence that people enjoy cooperating. Uh, and I think the right way to see the altruism and so on is, uh, of course, we sometimes feel constrained to do something which we really would not want to do, but we feel morally that we have to do it. And a lot of great literature could not have been written uh, if that weren't true. But I think the vast majority of us are more like Mother Teresa. What they do, they get a great deal of pleasure out of it. They do it because they've internalized those norms. Those norms are not constraints 
on their behavior. Those are the reasons for their behavior. They're the objectives themselves. They are like Abraham Lincoln who said, when I do good, I feel good. When I do bad, I feel bad. That's my religion. And the only problem with that quote is, he maybe didn't say it, but it, he is... <laughs> no, he is said to have said it, right? Uh, um, okay. Um, I want to sum up uh, and ask you for your comments and questions. This is Alexis de Tocqueville, uh, the, um, uh, the most high-class um, tour guide writer in the world, puts, puts Lonely Planet to shame. Democracy in America was exactly that. He went around America, and this is one of his conclusions. The Americans are fond of explaining all the, almost all the actions of their lives by the principle of self-interest, rightly understood. In this respect, I think they frequently fail to do themselves justice. In the United States, as well as elsewhere, elsewhere, people are sometimes seen to give way to those disinterested and spontaneous impulses that are natural to men, man, but the Americans seldom admit that they yield to emotions of this kind. The experimental evidence that I've given you and the limited reach of the self-interest models favor Tocqueville, not Mencken, and not Tocqueville's Americans. Now, that leads us to the next step. We have to think about how to re-ask the question about why humans cooperate. Biologists and economists have asked, why do selfish people cooperate? Or why do selfish animals cooperate? That's basically, that has been the question that has driven this literature really for the past uh, 40 years. Uh, and it's a fantastic literature, and I invite you to read it. I can, I can I mean, email me. It's, it's well worth mastering. But I think we've come to the end of the road with that literature. I want to ask something instead. I want to ask how humans evolved genetically, culturally, or most likely a combination of the two, to have the genuinely altruistic predispositions that account for much of our distinctive cooperation. It's a completely different question. How did we get to be the kind of people that would cooperate because we like to cooperate, because we like to help other people, or we feel ethically uh, that it's a good thing to do? Now, doing this is not, uh, uh, there's no hammer here. Because I'm attempting to overturn a consensus that this is impossible. It's impossible that we could have evolved to be that way because by the very definition of altruism, the altruist would gain fitness by abandoning altruism. And therefore, in any evolutionary dynamic, cultural, genetic, or whatever, which rewards higher payoffs, uh, those altruists would be disadvantaged. So that's a tough order. That's what I'm going to try to do tomorrow. But first I want to say where I'm going to end. Um, on Thursday evening, I'm going to conclude that those who ignore what Adam Smith in another great book, by the way, not The Wealth of Nations, he called his book The Moral Sentiments. What Adam Smith called our moral sentiments, people who ignore these, policymakers or sci scientific disciplines alike, are doing a disservice not only to our science, but to the well-being of humanity as well and to our possibility of having a flourishing and sustainable future. That's what I'll try to uh, establish on um, Thursday. But um, th definitely, that this is um, uh, the stuff tomorrow is up for grabs. Uh, it's, uh, it's all based on published research, but I have to say that I don't think I persuaded uh, everyone. Um, the uh, overturning the consensus, that's going to be hard. Uh, tomorrow I want to talk about, not the governor of California, uh, <laughs> but I want to talk about how altruism may have become common among humans. And my hypothesis is this. Humans became the cooperative species because of our capacities as institution builders. In biology, we would call it niche constructors. Constructors of little environments that worked uh, well for the cultivation of altruism and cooperation. And among these institutions that we were especially good at doing are things like sharing food with non-kin and, sadly, making war. I want to also stress tomorrow, and I'll give you some reasons for hope in this respect, that this legacy of sharing and killing need not be our destiny. That's up to us. I'll make a strong case that that is indeed our legacy, and it even could be our genetic legacy. 
But that has no bearing at all on what our destiny is. That's up to us, and I'll tell you why I think that's true. And tomorrow, we'll also play hypothetical history. Now, you can do it tonight, uh, and uh, you probably should start because I'm going to say some rather demanding things tomorrow. Uh, you may, you may want to have actually tried this out yourself. Um, don't wait for it to be on TV. When, you can run these computer simulations right off of my web page. I mean, seriously, I invite you to do this. If you go to this web page here, you'll find a, a heading. It says Artificial Histories. Uh, you, it allows you to, to run histories that could have happened. What I'm talking about tomorrow is based on five million possible histories of humanity that I have run with my co-authors. Uh, and, of course, we look at them and we figure out what's, what's possible from that. You can do a few tonight if you want. It's really fun. It's addictive. You have to be very careful to make sure that you go, go to bed uh, at a reasonable hour. Uh, so if you don't like what I tell you tomorrow, you can run your own histories and see what you get. Um, now, I want to thank my co-author, Herb Gintis. He's on the faculty of the Santa Fe Institute. Uh, my co-authors of all of this work, uh, the fantastic staff of the Santa Fe Institute, uh, particularly the librarians, uh, and my assistant, uh, Della Ulibari, Mar uh, Margaret Alexander, Tim Taylor, uh, Bay Smith, who used to be there. The staff at the Institute makes it all possible, uh, the uh, information technology, and just the spirit of the place. Can you imagine where I got the audacity to try to deal with all these topics? I mean, you know, you have to face it. There's a lot. There's a l I had to start on a lot of new fields. I had to learn a lot of new stuff. Well, I didn't do it myself. I, I know that nobody's door is closed at the Santa Fe Institute, so I bother people a lot. I'd also like, like to thank the uh, George Cowan Endowment to the Behavioral Sciences Program that has uh, made this work possible and other funders. Uh, this is the Institute. I'm sure you recognize it. That's uh, the um, University of um, Siena. Um, you'll find most of these, this, this is uh, a grouping, uh, what we, we work in large teams. The paper I'm currently working on has 24 authors. Uh, that's, that's how we work. Uh, and these are some of the papers, uh, some of these are co-authored, uh, some are not. Uh, most of them are available on my um, web page. If you can't find them, send me an email. Do email me if you want to talk about this. I respond to emails rather quickly. And I thank you all for your attention. talk. I'm going to turn it over rather than me directing. I think it's much easier, more sensible to let Sam respond directly and, share and uh, point to uh, those that wish to make comments or ask questions. Sam, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, I'll recognize you, but you have to recognize... I, okay, good. I can see up in the back. I thought I couldn't. Uh, yeah, go and ahead. It might be, one, one other thing, it might be useful, Sam, for you to repeat the question. Repeat the question. Yeah, if yeah. I can. Yes, please. In the far back. Yes, you. <laughs> well, it's interesting. Fictive kin, which is what it's called in the literature, is a very common uh, characteristic of the ways in which we justify and we rhetorically uh, advocate the kinds of giving to people to who are not related to us. Now, that kind of altruism, fictive kin altruism, uh, would not evolve for genetic reasons because the person who is my fictive kin is not my relative. Uh, it is, however, very important. Uh, there, I mean, very often when you're sharing goods with somebody, you make them a fictive kin. We do that, for example, by adoption, obviously, but you also do it by, for example, considering somebody, if you're going to share a member of your herd with somebody else, very often there's a, a fictive kin operation. But also consider the uses of the family terms. In the trade unions of many countries, uh, members call each other brother and sister. Uh, that's another extension of that idea, but it doesn't work genetically. It's just a linguistic way that we have of making it seem like the stuff that happens at home. And it's one of the great hopes of our species today in the world that we can start using whatever rhetorical tricks we can find to extend to others the things which we naturally extend to our children and our parents. Yes.
Yeah. Yeah. So I put a monkey wrench in how? Yeah. Yes. There's uh, ESS. Just ma it's the, it's a technical term, evolutionarily stable strategy. It means if everybody's doing it, it can't be invaded by somebody doing something different. In that game, the public goods game, there is only one ESS if people are selfish, and that is nobody contribute anything. And that's also the case even if there's punishment if people are selfish. So. Uh, The only way you can get people contributing is because somebody's altruistic, at least somebody. Uh, I'm, not tr I'm not troubled by the second scenario. I, mean, I, I, I must have not communicated clearly. Uh, yeah, way in the back. Uh, well, I, I don't think that what happened during the Enlightenment, in terms of the things you said, it was, it was certainly a, a brilliant period in uh, par parts of Europe, in European history. Uh, similar periods have taken place in other parts of the world, in the China and India, the areas I know best. Uh, so that th there's nothing particularly unique about that. Um, I will talk about consciousness tomorrow when I talk about the consciousness of being different from other people. Uh, but I won't talk about the consciousness in the more broad psychological sense. Um, um, yeah. Um, Speak up, though, because you're going to have to project back. Sure. That gene or, or, or combination of genes will be propagated by those people that are altruistic. So I'm altruistic. You may not have the gene or you may have the gene, but I'm altruistic because uh, by being, being altruistic, that gene shows up more prominently in the next generation of human beings. So it's really a question of how it's a Well, unfortunately, altruism and smoking cigars, both of which I uh, plead guilty to, or in the past, uh, it, I don't still smoke cigars, in the past was the cigars, uh, <laughs> both of them would have the same effect, which is they reduce your fitness. And if this, uh, your question is exactly the $64,000 question that I'm going to try to address tomorrow. How is it possible that something like altruism could actually proliferate Well, except for the fact that the altruists are doing worse than the other ones, and so they're not going to be any altruists left. They have the genes to get them. That's how genes, that, I mean, natural selection should eliminate them, and of course the puzzle is, I mean, you can all think about how can you solve this problem. Probably you can guess uh, how some of them are, but the interesting thing is that until at least recently, biologists thought that none of them worked. None of them worked. I think that at least one of them works. Uh, that's what I'm going to talk about tomorrow. Uh, Yes. Um, well, if you, it, I said in large groups of non-kin, yes. Um, 
The, uh, now, there are some forms of cooperation that do not appear to be very closely linked to genetic relations, uh, genetic relatedness, for example, in chimps. Uh, so, there, I mean, there, there probably are some analogs to this, and there's some recent experiments, extremely controversial, which suggest that there may be some forms of reciprocity uh, and, uh, among some primates, but uh, I think um, basically, uh, I think the last 10 years have not been very favorable towards finding human-like cooperative and altruistic tendencies in other, um, uh, in other, even other primates. Um, now, but that is, I mean, talk about a restart, that's a, that is a totally hot topic now. Uh, and there's some wonderful experiments being done. We'll know a lot more later. Yeah, in the back there. Yeah, you. Yeah. Yeah, now that, that's a very good question, and I'll be able to answer it better tomorrow, but I, I feel obligated to answer a little bit. You're absolutely right on in thinking that I'm related to my kids, and I'm related to my parents and my sibs very closely, obviously. I may be related to members of my linguistic group also, but obviously much more distantly because there are hundreds of them. But it might be that the fact that I'm related to these people in my linguistic group, including strangers, more than I'm relating to the, pe to the people in the other valley, that could be a crucial fact. That fact is going to come back tomorrow because it doesn't take much of that to power a lot of evolutionary force for altruism. So that's, you, we're going to come back to that insight. Yeah. Do um, I think I'm going to postpone that to tomorrow because to answer, in basically, there is a truth to that, it, and it has to have been, I'll explain exactly what it is. Relatedness is a confusing word, because it could mean kin, meaning uh, uh, a recent common ancestor. Or it could mean just people who share more genes with me than a randomly selected person in the population. That's exactly what I'm doing tomorrow. I'm going to distinguish between those and show how they both work. Uh, yes? Absolutely. So that's it. That's enough. Okay. <laughs> I, 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 I love your question or questions. And let me start first. Notice she, she, she noticed a discrepancy between my saying that people played the game the same all around the world, except 
in my experiments with the lamellaria and the uh, people in the Amazon and so on, what's going on here? All the other experiments were done with students. And I don't have a good answer to this, but we had tremendous cultural differences in our experiments in different parts of the world, which were not with students, which we didn't see when you do it with students wherever you are. Now, students have a very similar life. They have similar ambitions. They have similar kind of things that they have to do. They have to do things like what you're doing, which is to sit quiet while somebody's giving you a lecture, and so on. It doesn't matter where you are. That could be the reason. But the fact is very clear. We deliberately picked societies which had as little in common with each other as possible, and that meant not exposed to the same modernizing forces like states and markets. And what we found was uh, very interesting. We found a lot of differences, so that's true. Now, here's, here's an interesting um, criticism of the, uh, the fraternity of people who do these experiments. Most of these experiments, for most of the time that they've been hot, which is about two decades now, have been aimed at showing that economics is wrong. Though they've been done by economics, they've been aimed at showing something about human nature in general. So they're, it's called essentialism in philosophy. Uh, they wanted to figure out what humans were like, and they wanted to say, we're not like homo economicus, we're like homo something else. Oh, by the way, that's when I got the restra on my uh, email because I was using the word homo economicus all the time, and it said, you're using a rude term. Uh, um, <laughs> honest to God, it did. Uh, uh, so, um, uh, so, so the problem is, we, we were designing experiments to find out under which conditions people were and weren't selfish. We were not asking the very good question that you were asking, which is, well, does it differ by social class, by educational level? But we've, you know, by chance, we found out a fair amount. I'll give you just a few things. Uh, one is, accidentally, we found out that African Americans are much more justice-minded than European Americans. Uh, that's not a big surprise, perhaps. They give exactly 50% offers, and they reject anything below 50% with very high probability. Uh, we've also found that in some areas of generosity, the farther down you are in terms of income and so on, because we're now doing these w at truck stops in the Midwest. People have a lot of time, so we do these, we do these in factories. Uh, and, uh, so, well, you know, you have to take a little rest. You've already talked to the wife, and uh, so you get a game going, and you know, uh, and you get people who are not students. And yeah, we're finding out they're different. Uh, now, are these differences caused by the social structural things you said? I'm convinced they are. Uh, I'm, but I have to admit to you, I was convinced that they are before the experiments because I read a lot of history and anthropology and it just seems perfectly reasonable that people who grow up catching whales are going to have a different set of values and norms and ways of behaving than people who grow up, say, doing industrial work or maybe uh, uh, provisioning themselves by catching small animals and uh, uh, other things. Now, what do I know about that now? Well, uh, we know a lot about how your economic circumstances has a big impact on the kinds of values that you have. Uh, some of the work is reasonably old, uh, but the, 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 the work that we did about the Lamellera, for example, um, one of the things we did, we took these 15 societies and we said, let's rank them according to how valuable it would be in that ecology to cooperate. So very valuable if you're catching whales, not very valuable if you're doing slash and burn agriculture or uh, some horticulture, it's very low technology horticulture. Uh, and that what we found was that the places which were relying on their cooperation in order to, to survive, well, sure enough, they were very fair in the ultimatum game and, and uh, uh, the, places, the other places tended to be much lower. So, we're, we're getting some information now of an experimental nature that allows us to say that yes, the values that people have are formed by their everyday experiences uh, and it'll be a long time before we have it really well understood. But, uh, and if you want to know more about this, this happens to be something that I'm working on. Uh, yeah. Yes. Well, they didn't. No, the, the, the subjects were inside the machine, but yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, I, uh, if I'd had more time, that's one of the reasons, by the way, why I think that people enjoy cooperating. You, you do an ultimatum game, and the subject is inside the thing, and then he hears what offer has been given him, right? And then he can either press the button, accept, or reject. And by the way, the, the fMRI is a non-invasive brain scan that actually takes slices of your brain, and it looks at the activation of uh, uh, the blood activation, therefore the oxygen activation of particular areas. 
we think we know something about which areas do what. That's, by the way, we don't know as much as we should, but we're pretty sure that some areas have to do with the processing of rewards, while other areas have to do with the processing of more cognitive things, balancing uh, uh, costs and benefits. So we find out what's going on when somebody says no to a bad offer. Uh, and guess what we found out? Well, I didn't, I didn't do these studies, but there are a bunch of them now being done. Ernst Fair, some of the big people, the big guys doing these ultimatum games all now have fMRI machines. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the rejection of offers uh, gives a sense of pleasure in the sense that it's processed in the part of the brain that processes other things that are rewarding. And the receiving of a bad offer is experienced as disgust. The author of that study said that as the areas which are activated are the same areas that are activated if you're shown a plate of uh, rotten food. Now, isn't that interesting that we could have evolved to have a sense and a brain that works according to something like moral disgust? It would be maybe fitness enhancing. It may lower your fitness if you eat rotten food, and it also may lower your fitness if you don't stand up for justice. Uh, but the fact that the same part of the brain is processing that is suggestive. Now, I happen to be in the school that thinks that these interpretations of fMRI experiments so far have gone way beyond the, uh, in, uh, the empirical base, uh, base of these. It's because the uh, samples are extremely small, it's extremely hard to know what it means to say this area is being activated and so on. So, uh, this is just a warning. You'll find a lot of stuff being published which is making big claims. I think it's going to be, 10 years from now, a very interesting window into some aspects of why people are doing this. But we're not there yet. Yeah. That's exactly Thursday's talk. That's, uh, I, I, not only have I thought about that, that's mostly what I'm thinking about now, because that's obviously where I've been led to. Having established so far what we've got, okay, here we are, we're in a dangerous world which we are making more dangerous all the time. What can we do about it? Uh, maybe the constitution for knaves has failed. Maybe we have to try something else. I'll tell you what I think. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, say more about that. What, what would, what, yeah, but what's, what's the connection between the co commonality? Yeah. Well, that is a great question, and it's, it's a very interesting hypothesis. I'm convinced, I mean, I, I'm convinced both because I know something about genetics and human development, but also because I've lived a, a lot of my life in Africa and, uh, and uh, India. I'm convinced that we're all very similar. Uh, but what would make you disgusted is not what would make somebody else disgusted, even when it comes to food. Like in our country, we think that blue cheese smells good. Well, have you ever thought about it objectively? It smells like a lot of other things that we don't think smell bad, right? Uh, but I think the, the exactly the same analogy would hold. Uh, food disgust and moral disgust might be very, very different across cultures. But I think you're onto something when you're thinking that it might be that moral disgust, a visceral reaction against unfairness and injustice might in fact be something that's common to all people. If it's true, we're very lucky, but then again, we have to find ways of adjudicating between the competing claims about what is unjust and what is not. But the fact that people may have a sense of justice, deeply ingrained culturally, of course, but also possibly genetically, I think that's very good news for humanity. Okay, I think 
That's a great place to stop. Humanity, you know, where, where else to end? <laughs> two more nights. Let's thank Sam again. Thank you. Great.